Hello, how's it going? Questions? Hey Will, thanks for continuing to create all your videos. You're welcome. You helped me a lot so far. I mean, I sent the three questions I have for you to an email that I long to post here. Yeah, go for it. Send them through. I'll put the email in the chat. There you go. Send them to that one. All right, who else has got some questions? Hope everyone's had a good day. Freezing cold here, ice and snow everywhere. Still managed to get a bit of gym done in the garage with no heater. Soon warmed up. Every now and again, I think about maybe upgrading it. But I think it's not really worth it. Nothing a little bit of effort can't solve. How should a father to be prepare for the birth of his first child? How can he be supportive during pregnancy and the first few months of the newborn's life, especially when sleep deprived? I've never really found the sleep deprivation to be that bad. All this stuff about people needing seven to eight hours of sleep a day or they can't function. There's plenty of guys who get by on five hours sleep or so, especially if you have a nap during the day when the baby's having a nap, you'll be fine. But the main thing is that it's going to be difficult, especially in the third trimester for your wife moving around. So just try and do as much as you can for her involving lifting, moving the stuff around the house, even things like hoovers, laundry, shopping in and out of cars. All of that's really helpful if you can lend a hand with it. That's part of what the providing and protecting role is all about. Pregnancy, especially in the last few months, is almost worse than having a newborn for the first couple of months. So I try to sympathize. All right, next question. What does worship mean to you? I struggle with this idea of fearing God. I don't think love or worship can derive from fear. Respect, sure, but not fear. Well, worship is fundamentally a relationship of justice. So religion isn't really about your, your feelings. It's about what you owe God in justice for the fact that he upholds you in existence in every moment and everything good about you comes from him. Where does the idea of fear come into it? Well, in the Gospels, we're told not to fear anybody who can just destroy the body, but he who can cast the soul into hell. So that's where the fear really comes in. And it's not as in phobia, like people often talk about fear nowadays. You know, I've got a phobia of heights or spiders or whatever. It's just this irrational fear that I've got. Instead, once you understand what God is and your duties towards him and the fact that he is omnipotent and omniscient as well. So he knows everything that you've done that's bad, all your shortcomings. And also will mete out perfect justice. Well, that's where the fear comes in. It's purely rational. Now, you can love someone while also fearing them same idea isn't it now you say you don't think genuine love derives from fear it doesn't really derive from the fear the love is what you owe god in justice and the fact that he's perfectly good etc the fear just comes as a consequence of who he is the love isn't because of the fear all right, next question. Does that answer that question, Jimmy? If not, let me know, I'll try again. What do you think of Jordan Peterson? And have you noticed, <laughs> have you noticed he cries a lot? Yeah, I don't think he used to cry this much. Um, I find the question funny. I don't find it funny that he cries. I think it's sad that he cries. He's obviously hurting somehow. Like everyone who is spiritually sensitive, but hasn't actually taken the plunge 
even somebody like Nietzsche is like that ultimately spent his whole life searching for some kind of salvation so what do you think of Jordan Peterson I've mentioned a few a few times already that the main problem is the slipperiness when it comes to basic things like the objectivity of truth which he's denied or evaded multiple times in interviews the other thing is this vaguely spiritual but not religious worldview and the tendency to reduce things to myth and metaphor so i like pascal's point as i've mentioned a few times that if jesus wasn't actually resurrected if it didn't really happen then the whole of christianity falls apart and my sense is that peterson wants to regard the resurrection as some kind of metaphor for self-transcendence and the idea that you can save yourself is a big part of 12 rules for life and that if you just tidy your room then that's going to achieve something fundamental there's some truth to that in the individual responsibility is important but you can't actually save yourself and to the extent that peterson encourages that i think to that extent he's wrong i know some people say that he's led them to christianity brilliant if that's so but there are many many more people looking at him thinking well he's not christian so he must have a good reason for that how do we define good and evil i guess you're thinking about what it is for a human action to be good or evil and that essentially is to do with natural law so what is it about us as rational creatures that makes things good was well, action in conformity with our rational nature it's what makes us flourish and natural law in that sense is basically just god's signature in man so what kind of thing have we been created as and that is a rational animal who is ordered towards knowledge and virtue and what we really want knowledge of is god human beings are built for the beatific vision and god is supreme goodness truth goodness beauty the transcendentals as aquinas put it are all convertible so beauty is the the goodness of reality god as truth so all those things are wrapped up and that's what human beings are made for and what we're all searching for and evil isn't a thing in its own right we haven't got the, the manichaean worldview where there's two equally powerful beings one good one evil fighting each other instead what we've got is evil as the privation the absence of good so hopefully that answers the question why do you think jesus disappears from the stories in the bible after he is reincarnated well it depends what you mean by disappeared so after the ascension he doesn't just leave human life human history altogether he's still influencing the church he's still guiding it and he's still communicating with the saints etc and we're still being supported by him but the simple answer to that is that that part of the earthly mission is done so after the resurrection appearances and everything's been completed then that's why he disappears but it doesn't mean he's gone totally what do you make of the news that france is going to provide free condoms to those aged 18 to 25 it was a bad idea isn't it because it's encouraging promiscuity so i don't think that should be subsidized it's going to be giving people the impression that this is a good thing to be getting involved in and condoms haven't got 
particularly high reliability as contraception goes. All contraception is degenerate, but what you'll see from that is, I would guess, probably a slight increase in fornication. And some of those condoms aren't going to work. There'll be some pregnancies and likely some abortions as well. That age group, 18 to 25, really they should be getting encouraged to get married and have kids, not use contraception. In a healthy country, you get a lot of people in that age range married. So I think they should put their efforts into that instead. The Catholic Church interests me, but I'm discouraged by the progressiveness of recent popes. How do you accept them? Well, a lot of people have this weird misunderstanding about infallibility. They seem to think that whatever a, a pope says, it is infallible. But that's not actually true. I'm just putting some notes together on this for a different bit of content, actually. So I might as well just pull this up here. Uh, the Catholic Church has never defined that the popes are always infallible in all that they personally believe. The Catholic Church declares that the pope is infallible when he gives an official definition of doctrine concerning faith or morals, it being required that he acts freely, that he declares himself to be acting in his capacity as head of the whole church, and that he intends his definition to be binding upon all the faithful throughout the world. Not one of these last requirements is involved in these instances where people say, look at what the Pope has said, this is really controversial and it's putting me off uh, being Catholic or maybe I even want to leave the church if I am Catholic. So you can have bad Popes and they're not pronouncing infallibly when they're saying the things that you think are bad. And the best response is just to say, well, the church has weathered these kind of storms in the past and the trees, the fruit might shake, but we know that the roots ultimately are being fed by the divine spring and it will get through it. So that's how I accept it. The papacy is infallible and God won't let the church fail. And if you look at the history of it, all the things that's come through, you find plenty of evidence for taking that position. Alexi, right, I'll check that email, I'll get it in a second. Uh, could you detail what Rome's collapse looked like concretely? Military, society, economy, etc. So I've got a video on this, but in a nutshell, they get to the point where they can't man their own army with Romans anymore because of below replacement fertility due to all kinds of sexual degeneracy, marriage avoidance, and the elites in particular starting this kind of behavior. Now, if you can't man your own army with the traditional soldier farmers, you're in trouble. So they end up having to rely on immigration and mercenaries to get the job done instead. And this is what we see in countries and cultures throughout history that a below replacement fertility rate is one of the strongest signs of decline. So in combination with not being able to man their own army, relying on mercenaries, and also the elites no longer upholding what the Roman traditions were, you've got a pretty good recipe for disintegration, especially when you add in the sexual degeneracy too. What's interesting is that economically, um, Rome was booming when it fell. People think that economic factors caused the, uh, the fall of Rome as if the Teutonic tribesmen somehow thought they'd, uh, they'd conquer it with uh, meddling with the market. No, that's not what happened at all. So economy looked good. Military didn't have much manpower and society weakened by marriage avoidance primarily. So that's the short answer to that one. But there's a whole video on that if you want to go into more detail. What words of encouragement could you give a couple struggling to conceive a child? And what are your thoughts on IVF? Oh, this is a tough one, isn't it? So some people, and 
through no fault of their own. And by that, I mean they haven't put off uh, having kids for so long by prioritizing careers that the fertile years have gone, can't conceive. And you need to just accept that if that happens as a, as a cross to bear and don't give up hope, don't give up trying because a lot of people try for years and think this is never going to work, then it does. So use those as examples to inspire some hope. The other thing is that even if you never do conceive a child, your marriage is still really important and valuable just for you and your wife. So there's always that to focus on and you're still called to loving self-sacrifice within the marriage whether there are kids or not so if it happens great but if it doesn't focus on being grateful for your marriage anyway i always wanted a large family but don't think i'd be able to afford it as i don't make much money kids aren't actually that expensive so i've got number seven coming and the biggest shock is going from zero to one and that's not even financially that's just in terms of extra responsibility and not being quite so carefree but kids aren't as expensive as people make them out to be it's a very liberal idea that you want to limit the number of kids you have so that they can have all kinds of fancy gadgets and holidays and private school fees but really what's better for a child than all of that is another sibling because they build that relationship so my guess is you're probably overthinking it i mean if you can afford your rent or your mortgage and you're holding a good job down and have you already got kids at the moment two three uh, have you got a family and it's just you're worried about more crunch the numbers and a little bit of extra food is involved uh, i had to get a bigger car when we went above five kids that was a little bit expensive especially now you need to get a nine seater so cars can be irritating, but if you're willing not to go on holidays abroad so much, then you'll be able to afford it. And what you'll find generally is that the more you go with God's will, the more you follow natural law, which means big families, the better your life's going to get. And there's a kind of wealth involved in having lots of kids that no amount of money can replace anyway. All right, next question. <laughs> what is your new year's resolution read a bit more of the bible each day and then say a few more prayers each day and then also try to reduce screen time i found ever since making content online the mixture of different platforms that it's easy to get sucked in to just doing too much especially with smartphones there's always something you can be doing i normally have quite a few ideas buzzing around my mind so the temptation is always just to make a note down. That note will develop into a paragraph or an idea for an essay or a video. So I need to just not do it so much, just put it away. I don't really struggle too much with anything to do with uh, health and fitness. I just, once I make a plan, I can just stick to that relatively easily. But it's more about uh, restraining myself rather than forcing myself to do things. If I'm interested in a project, I'll tend to just get tunnel vision and get it done. How can a husband be there for his wife during a time of major grief or a health scare? Too easy to feel helpless. We'll try and be there physically. That's the first thing. And then ask her what she needs. You can say a prayer for her as well. And then offer to go and get her anything from the shops that she needs read her a book sit and listen to music with her so it's difficult to know uh, exactly what it is without knowing a bit more about what your wife's going through but my guess would be that you're better off asking her that question than me but you shouldn't feel helpless as long as you're there offering your help then you'll be able to fulfill whatever it is have you considered teaching at a catholic all boys schools no, not right now. Uh, maybe one day. At the moment, I'm happy not being in schools. So I don't like the look of many of them. And Eton was originally Catholic, and that was the pinnacle of UK education, 
when I do things, I like to go all in and take it very seriously. So Eton was the top school. And uh, after working there for nearly a decade and seeing the way things are going, I haven't got a lot of hope for other places. And I think all boys schools in general are uh, dwindling and under attack specifically. And the more that happens, the more there'll be stuff going on outside them to make up for their shortcomings. People get too excited about schools generally too because you've got to remember that family is where it's at really and uh, schools can't make up for deficiencies in family education and they're never really going to be more important than family environment either. So I've got my own kids to teach and then uh, you guys online as well. I respect the Orthodox Church, however, I still can't get my head around the fact that they allow their priests to marry. What's your opinion on this and on the importance of celibacy for priests? Well, family responsibilities are, are pretty heavy. So the Catholic Church is right to say that priests can't marry because their attention is going to get diluted in either direction. So they won't be doing either job properly. The priest is like a, a father to the family of the, the parish, if you like. So it's an acknowledgement that we don't want him being spread too thin. The Catholics and Orthodox agree on most things. Um, the real root disagreement is the, the primacy and infallibility of the papacy. Someone asked me about this a while ago. I've got that substack with the eight reasons not orthodox. Jay Dyer did a, a stream and there was about a 20 minute section on my list. I haven't actually watched it yet, but if you guys want to check that out, then he'll probably have some responses to the stuff that I said if you're interested in getting into that. I'm interested in converting to Catholicism. Is there a particular church mass I should aim to attend? No, I don't think so. So Novus Ordo is a valid mass. So is the traditional Latin mass. Some guys really prefer the atmosphere of the TLM because they feel like it's got more reverence to it. I mean, it's in Latin for one thing, so it's not your everyday language that separates it off with this aura of sacredness. But if you haven't got one near you, just go to the Novo Ordus, Novo Ordus mass. Uh, that would be fine. Um, if you're 35 and single, what would be more aligned with natural law, marrying a 30-year-old or a 20-year-old? Well, natural law doesn't really come into the age, so you want to look at things like compatibility and how well you get on with them. Either could be good. 20-year-old is likely to have more fertile years, ahead of her if your priority is having as many kids as you can but I'm not saying that the 20 year old is automatically going to be better you need to look at the the virtue of the woman as well as just the age would it be reasonable to say that infertile couples are morally obliged to adopt children no <laughs> They're not morally obliged to. If they want to, I think that's a good thing, but they're not morally obliged to. You can even have couples who are married and could have kids, but instead decide to have a, a chaste marriage. And they're not using contraception. They're just chaste the entire time. So you can get a, a, a celibate marriage. I think that's very, very rare, but is possible. Having said that, I think people who are infertile, it is good to explore adoption. All right, next question. I feel like I have a lot I need to fix about myself. Should I try to improve myself before having kids or will having kids work to improve me? Well, I've got a lot I need to fix about myself. I don't know anybody who doesn't, so I don't let that put you off. It's likely that if you're married and you've got kids, then your whole life is basically going to be muddling through trying to fix yourself and improve various things. Every single day, the struggle never ends. You're not going to reach a point where you're somehow 
you're safe and you've achieved a big victory over all of that. So don't let that stop you. My advice would be have kids sooner rather than later. Single man who grew up with the faith until 18, then lived in an atheist feminist way. Yeah, those two things normally go together until mid 30s. Now understanding why Christianity is the way. Advice to live virtuously from now. Well, we can start with pruning back and hopefully eliminating any bad habits that you built up over the last decade and a bit. So, content consumption, TV, film, music. What kind of things have you been accustomed to there that actually you probably shouldn't be watching, listening to, or reading? There's that line isn't there from Jesus that if you're not with him you're against him so I'd be careful about the kind of things that you put into your mind or in front of your eyes is it with or against and then choose accordingly the other thing is rather than just cutting things out what habits do you need to build I'm guessing that you're probably not in the habit of praying regularly so when you wake up in the morning prayer gratitude grace before and after meals prayer before you go to bed if you're catholic say the rosary every day try and read a bit of the bible or some kind of spiritual text every day that would help as well and that's probably quite a lot of work to begin on with for now but if there's something else you want to note hit me with another question <laughs> How do you celebrate Christmas without lying to your kids about Santa? And what's the best way to deal with family members and other parents who don't understand? Just tell them Santa doesn't exist. My kids know he doesn't exist. If you lie to anyone, it's bad. But if you lie to your kids about that for, what is it, a decade or something? Most kids just figure out when they're about 10. Then they're going to be thinking, what? He lied to me for a whole decade? Maybe he's lying about God as well. Maybe you're lying about the devil. So just tell them there's no Santa. And if the family members don't want to play along and uh, they want to insist there is, then just tell your kids that they'll soon find out there's no Father Christmas, but the family members are doing it because they think they're being kind. They think it's sweet. But you guys know together that we just have to shrug it off and let them have their game. But most uh, most family members, if you just tell them straight that you've told your kids it's no Santa, uh, they won't want to keep it going. What is your advice on staying motivated to do things like working out when it's so cold outside? I don't know if you hear at the start of the stream, but I was saying that I just managed to get in the unheated garage today and do something. I would just put an extra jump on, get out there, get moving. And then once you've gone to the trouble to actually start the ball rolling, you won't want to go back inside and quit. For most guys, it's just about keeping momentum. So I always try and do a little bit of training every day, even if it's just something tiny like a set of chin-ups. Then at least you've gone in there, you've done it. Because the way that people get into the bad habits is that they'll just let a few days go by and it'll turn into a week, then two weeks. And then they'll be thinking, oh, really messed up now. And it feels like you've got to get the whole thing moving again. So consistency, even if it means minimal effort, just small things, keep that going. But having said that, I do do some things that are quite weird sometimes. So for example, if I've got no other option, sometimes I'll just train from 11 p.m. till midnight in my garage all by myself listening to Gregorian chant, and I think, this isn't normal, is it? But does it really matter? No, it doesn't. All right, let's comment on someone else's question. In America, it can cost a fortune to pay for healthcare for one's kids. Any advice for Americans who want more kids, but are already in debt due to medical bills from just one kid? 
Do you know what the best person to ask about this one would be Tim Gordon on the Sea Mask show with me? Because he's in America, he's got seven kids, and I know one of them has had some health problems. So I'll find out from him because I'm sure he uh, he was a teacher before he got sacked, same as me. So I don't know how it works with you guys with uh, getting healthcare paid by employers, but he's self-employed now. So let's see what he has to say next time. But I think generally the stuff I said for UK would apply in that you want to try and minimize superfluous expenditure and luxuries. But the advice wouldn't be, uh, you know, minimize the number of kids you're having because you're worried about money. You need to trust that if you're following God's plan for large families, he's going to help you out. And don't be afraid. I'm a male teacher. How do you gain the respect of teenage boys to manage behavior? I think that you previously said something about not letting the small things slide. Thanks. Yeah, that's the way it's done. As people have this idea that behavior management is about being like a tough guy and shouting, whatever. That's actually a sign of weakness more often than not. It's you've lost your temper. You want to just have a calm voice, fairly low, because the resonance of a man's voice has got a different effect in terms of calming, controlling a room than the more shrill voice of a woman. So boys will respond to that. And then consistency, stop them when they walk in the classroom, get them calm, shirts tucked in, looking smart, and they have to walk to the desk, stand behind the chair, and wait until you say it's time to sit down. And if there's anything you're not happy with, then you have to explain why, let them know, this is standard, so they can actually get the benefit of the environment that you've set up for their benefit. They're not gonna understand properly why you're really doing this, Aristotle makes the point that when it comes to training in virtue, first of all, we have to force people to behave how we want them to behave. And only then do they understand why you were doing it. Like my toddler, he can't understand really why we're brushing his teeth. He can't understand uh, all the various habits that we've got in place. He's too young, but later on, he'll get it. And it's the same with teenage boys. I made the mistake when I first started teaching of thinking that, uh, you can walk in a room and if you're physically imposing then that's it you can just kind of relax and have a laugh but the last thing is that these kids need is some kind of friend figure so don't ever try and befriend them you can be personable you can listen to what stories they might want to tell you about the weekend or whatever but you're not their friend and they don't need that kids hate a teacher who tries to be their friend they want you to give them an example of how to behave and how you conduct yourself. So don't be over familiar. Right. Isn't individualism the best safeguard of monogamy, increasing opportunity cost and therefore family? Thanks for being on the leading edge in many respects. Individualism as the best safeguard of monogamy. I'm not quite sure what you mean exactly by that. The, the family, in terms of uh, divorce being wrong, for example, is the best safeguard of monogamy because it means that it's your only option for sex, it's lifelong marriage. Individualism in the sense of liberalism, as in doing whatever you want, meaning that if you've had enough of a relationship, then you are in charge of your own life. You can just walk out. And as some liberal academics have termed divorce, it becomes an act of the liberal imagination. Then in that sense, it doesn't safeguard monogamy. It means there's a kind of license for promiscuity instead. If that's clear, let me know. If not, rephrase the question for me so I understand exactly what you're saying there. What's the best way to have intimacy with your wife without having more children and not using contraception? Do you just pull out before ejaculation? 
you can just use the natural family planning uh, approach, which is your, your wife's only fertile for six days out of her cycle. So you can have sex the rest of the time, but not those days. If you're not looking to have another child, that's good for you because it can actually increase the intimacy because building that bit of chastity into your relationship actually just increases your control over the whole thing and you get to know her body better anyway so i wouldn't use contraception natural family planning's got higher reliability than something like condoms anyway <laughs> Keegan, understand the significance of Christ, slow walking everyone to Christianity. Well, he do, he's not Christian and he doesn't actually worship Christ. And if he did understand the full significance of Christ and fully believed in the resurrection, then he would be telling people to act on that understanding. He would have acted on it himself. There's too much of Jung and this metaphorical idea of spirituality mixed into what he's saying. And there's also too much dodging of truth, to put it bluntly. So I don't buy that interpretation. With respect to less screen time, do you have any general thoughts on Heidegger? and his notion of Dasein, and how technology and modernity both deracinates and upsets our sense of being. I think that more and more people can basically live their lives in a fantasy realm. Yeah, I think it is uprooting. If you think about what community has looked like for most of human history, it's about small, close-knit groups, mostly face-to-face -face interactions, and manual labor. So nowadays, plenty of people get the majority of their interaction via screens, and it's not quite the same thing. If you look at that Machine Stops series of essays on Substack, you'll see that across that short story, E.M. Forster, before the internet was even invented, does a great job of predicting what the impact of the internet uh, in his mind was going to be and I think he's pretty much spot on uh, which school do you think is the best in England do you think it's Westminster perhaps I don't know probably not I think they're all very similar and I wouldn't worry too much about it I would focus on taking your studies outside school very seriously if you want to get a genuine education. I think people overthink and overrate the importance of school choice. What's your opinion on controversies surrounding parenting such as smacking as a form of punishment and pressuring kids into skills, recreational activities as opposed to letting them choose? Well, some kids need physical discipline others don't and I don't think you should be pressuring them into skills based or recreation based activities too much you want to follow what the natural bent is um, most of the time find something that the kid is interested in has some kind of aptitude in and then encourage them in that and let them get the self-esteem boost from excelling in something if they manage to put the effort in and if it's something they've really conquered and it's difficult but if you're always just going against the grain and trying to turn a kid into a, a sportsman, say, when he's not really, and he's actually more gifted in something like, who knows, uh, mechanics or programming, then I think you're largely wasting your time and probably worsening your relationship with him. Uh, Andrea, horrible answer. Uh, what was it to? Tell me which uh, question it was. Can't remember. On Twitter, you stated all Jews should become Catholics. Can you elaborate? Yeah, it's Catholicism is true. So you want everyone to be a member of the one true religion. If you don't, then 
why the truth is what everyone needs ultimately. So that's the answer to that one. Viagra is playing God. No, it's just like when you get a broken leg and you can get a splint to fix it so you can walk. If you've got a penis that doesn't work and someone's got some technology to help it work and fulfill its natural function, then go for it. It's not contrary to nature in the way that contraception is. It actually aids conception. So it's definitely not playing God any more than fixing someone's broken arm is. Is it possible to find your calling in your 30s? What would you advise someone who doesn't yet know what their calling in life is to do in order to find it? I think some people find it later in life than their 30s. So it's definitely possible. If you're Christian, then plenty of prayer, I think, will be helpful in finding your calling. You've also got things like have an honest look at what your actual aptitudes and interests are. And your calling is unlikely to be against those or somehow radically different from them talk to people who know you well as well if you've got different ideas about what you're supposed to be doing sometimes other people see stuff about yourself that you don't but yeah it's not too late do you think there is some deeply profound insight to me as a young man checking out society due to cultural subversion and no one directly targets the problem I'm not really a big fan of the subversion idea. I know it exists, but people tend to point the finger and say, those people subverted us. Well, you get subverted if you're susceptible to it. And what makes you susceptible to it is sin. Strong people, strong cultures don't get subverted. You can look at the Amish, for example. They haven't had much problems with subversion like with porn for example because they haven't got tvs they haven't got smartphones so is cultural subversion a thing yeah but why is it well because of sin really so why is suicide related to it well if people need god ultimately that's the only thing they can get any fulfillment in and they're not turning to him and that problem is being worsened by the fact that the education system or family life or peer group isn't helping them find him either, then we're looking at a, a spiritual symptom. If there's despair, for sure. Are you writing an article, making a video on T.S. Eliot? Yep doing some work on Elliot at the moment. I've read some of Joy's Dubliners I quite like. I think Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake are overrated, but there's some good stories in Dubliners. I'm looking at Elliot's After Strange Gods. Really important book about heresy and religion in modern literature. How do you manage multiple projects at the same time when there never seems to be enough hours in the day to get everything done? Yeah, you've got to prioritise, haven't you? You can't get to everything, just like you can't read all books, but then not all books are worth reading. Only a handful are, and you should be rereading those. Same thing with your time and projects. Make a list, recognise that some stuff is probably just pipe dreams, and which are the ones that matter most. And then don't try and do them all at once, just be consistent, and let it add up over time. Douglas Murray's work. I met Douglas. He's a nice guy. Um, I think that he's quite good at diagnosing some of the problems, but he's pretty bad on solutions and his diagnosis doesn't go far enough. I mean, the strange death of Europe isn't actually that strange. When you look at contraception, when you look at the levels of homosexuality, etc. But there's only so far you can give secular answers to that and in my view he's really uh hamstrung by his inability to get into the proper metaphysical and religious answers that the questions he raises demand oh andrea didn't like the viagra answer yeah what did you like about it 
contraception stops someone getting pregnant, Viagra just helps the natural function. How do you get full marks in A-level English Lit papers? You can hire me as a tutor, but I'm really expensive because I'm the Rolls Royce of English tutors. Because that's what I've been doing since I was about 19. I'll help you get that. Probably, but I can't guarantee it. But it's going to involve a lot more knowledge of set text and a lot more essay practice and quote memorizing than you might have appetite for. But if you are up for it, then let's give it a go. Is A-level English lit worth teaching? Marxism and feminism often seem to feature prominently. So what? You can teach Marxism and feminism, and the syllabus says that kids have to know the arguments for and against. So when I taught those, it always used to be just fireworks. I just hammered them, saying, and here are all the stuff against them you probably never heard before. And then kids would be walking out knowing top 10 arguments against feminism having probably never even heard one argument against it. And then you also want to steel man it as well, so make it sound as good as possible. So you can teach it for sure, and you can teach it really well. That's part of the fun of it. Denial of our bodies is blessed, Trinity. I'm not following you there. Have I seen the Christian film Silence? Nope, I will check it out, 2016. Thoughts on Dostoevsky's Underground Man. That's the first Dostoevsky book that I read. Um, I was at school, I think, when I read that. And that really got me into him. Uh, Crime and Punishment next, then Brothers Karamazov, and really enjoyed it. So if no one's read that, I think you should go for it. There's that bit when he talks about being horribly sensitive, easily offended. And that's such a great prophecy, almost, of what liberal man ends up as, as we can see in woke which is the full flowering of liberalism what is the most based christian denomination beyond catholicism orthodox i haven't really thought about that too much to be honest those are the two that have got most in common orthodox and catholics agree on most things bar the papacy is the main one and some other details of doctrine so I don't tend to argue much with orthodox guys because other than that, there's not a lot to argue about. Hmm. Let me think about that. I'll get to that one next week. Some of them are just complete nuts, like the ones that deny free will. And I won't even bother discussing that with people because why did I even want to? If I haven't got any free will, then what are they going to do? Convince me of something? No, of course not. You just have to let things be as they are. Uh, religion is a product of mental illness. Well, in that case, why have the greatest minds of Western culture been religious ones? And why is it that a secular worldview can't even account for human rationality itself? Whereas religion says that God is supreme rationality. That one makes no sense to me. Um... English Lit A-Level put me off literature. Great Gatsby was rubbish. I keep meaning to do an essay on The Great Gatsby. I've got a YouTube short on it. That's actually a good book, and it tells you some important things about feminism and also manhood. So Tom is what I like to call the effeminate alpha. And you can see that because he's too weak to control himself sexually. He's a poor husband because of this. He's the one that most kids reading that book will think is impressive because he's muscular, etc. But that book predicts a lot of things that go wrong in modern liberal society with this confusion between love and romance. Love is about willing the objective good of another person, and romance is just this squishy feeling that you can fall into or fall out of, and it's not really about willpower. So, of the books you've listed there, that one's got some potential. But I agree, there is some stuff on the syllabus that is not worth reading. Right, I've got to head off in a second. Um, what? Why is Catholicism the only valid religion in the world? Well, Islam is good in that it is monotheistic. 
so is Judaism. So we can get to that point with just philosophical reasoning, monotheism. But then Christianity in particular, you've got the fact that the resurrection is the ultimate bedrock of it. That's the thing that you have to confront. Uh, Muhammad's got no proof of his uh, divine purpose or, or message. There's no miracles. So that's another difference between the two. But whenever I get this question, I just say, go straight to the resurrection, look at the alternatives to believing in it. What are you going to have to believe if you don't believe in the resurrection? And then why is it the only valid Christian church, for example? Well, we've got the fact that Christ built his church on the rock, Peter, and then the papacy develops out of that. And it's absurd to think that God would communicate with mankind having created him, institute a church, and then not guide it, not direct it, and just leave people to argue amongst themselves and end up in the situation we've got with Protestantism, with 39,000 plus different denominations, all claiming they're right, and people just having to make their minds up. All right, um, thoughts on Pentecostalism? not the true church, uh, growing up as a Mormon, Catholic seems to be more liberal by comparison. There's some liberal strains in Catholicism for sure, and that's a problem, isn't it? But that's because the tradition hasn't been communicated properly or followed properly. It doesn't mean Mormonism is actually true, whereas Catholicism isn't. Um, Matthew Raphael Johnson, yeah, I did an interview with him, and I want to speak to him again soon about agrarianism. So if you haven't watched the interview, go back and look at it. Like I said, most like the orthodoxy guys, I agree with pretty much everything they have to say, including Jay Dyer and anyone else who's going to be just giving standard orthodox views on things. There's a small number of points that Catholics and Orthodox disagree on. Um, right, last question is, in my early 30s and only now considering family, do you think it's too late in life to get married? No, definitely not. Get married now. You're still young, early 30s, and then you've got a long life ahead of you. So you shouldn't be thinking like that at all. Okay, guys, that's it. Nice talking to you, and I'll see you next week. Take care. Bye.